Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Cheryl, and I'm joined, as always, today by Chris Lines, and we're going to be discussing guitar wireless systems, and we have some very special guests here today that are going to help us help talk us through guitar wireless, uh, the first one being one of our senior staff engineers, John Halverson, and the other being uh, Dave Mendez, who is a senior system support engineer here, both very, very smart gentlemen, but also fantastic guitar players, so you are going to get some great information from both these guys. Um, they, they really know what they're talking about. Um, but before we get into that, just a few quick items of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be available sometime within the next week or two at shore.com slash training. All of our past webinars are archived there, and so you can access them at any time. Um, there's a lot of great information across a lot of great different subjects, anywhere from IT audio to podcasting to um, subjects like this, wireless for guitar, wireless for singers, just lots of great information. So please feel free to go to shore.com slash training and peruse all of our past webinars. Um, second of all, we will be taking questions at the end of the session. Um, so please type any questions you have as we go along and we will answer those at the end as time permits. Um, if you do not see the question pane, just look for a little toolbar. It'll be a little gray toolbar that has an orange box with a white arrow in it. Click on that. That should maximize the little pane and give you access to the question section. Um, so that is all the boring stuff. Let's get into the good stuff. Take it away, guys. Tell us all about Wireless for Guitar. Thank you, Cheryl, and welcome Dave and John. And let me make it very clear at the outset, not only am I not a fantastic guitar player, I am not a guitar player. So if I say something stupid and that makes everybody think, is he crazy? You would never use that kind not of Not yet, stuff. Chris, not yet. <laughs> it's only, Taking it's, lessons, It's right? only I mean, been 15 seconds, so. You taking know. lessons. Yes, that's what I should do. I'm, I'm still working on that first string, you know. Uh, all right, so let's jump into this. Uh, first of all, if you want to learn more about wireless microphone systems and guitar systems in general, Shure's got a great handbook written by our own Tim Veer uh, that goes into exhausting detail about how wireless systems work, antennas, antenna distribution, transmitters, receivers, frequency allocation, the whole nine yards. So if you really want to go in depth, especially about the RF side of it, that's a great resource. You can uh, download that from our website as a PDF. So uh, definitely check that out if you haven't read it. It's really educational. You'll probably find something good in there. Um, but uh, specifically, let's talk about guitar wireless today. And John, why is this so difficult? It has a mystique to it even. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess guitar wireless, is, it, it comes down to, you know, when, when we design wireless microphone systems, uh, predominantly, that's for vocal stuff, and guitar is is kind of this um, subset of of use cases, and it's a very different signal type. And so, you know, trying to trying to keep the uh, the guitar systems uh, good, uh, but still design a single system that that works for everybody has always been kind of the tricky part. Um, you know. Microphones drive the business, and uh, you know we guitar players get relegated to uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit of the back seat. But uh, you know, there's people like me who've always been very passionate about guitars and stuff, and we keep up the good fight and fight mm -hmm. the good fight, and just make sure that you know we're we're looking at both of things and considering both things, and and spending the time to make sure that the the guitar stuff is is good. Mm -hmm. um, we were lucky enough to release our first guitar specific system, the GLX D16, not mm -hmm. too long ago, and that was a uh, that was a, uh, a a piece that I'd been hoping we'd done 10 years ago, 20, you know, 15 years ago. We've always been talking about it and we finally got to got to make a guitar pedal receiver wireless system for guitar. That was yeah, I was just going to say, for people that don't know, the GLX-D system has got a uh, receiver in the form factor of a guitar pedal. So yeah. you, you put it on the floor in front of you instead of somewhere in, in a know rack what or something. Are. Yeah. I know that, but <laughs> there you go. And it's, got you a, go. it's got a really nice built-in tuner. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time uh, you know, looking at all the tuners out there and, and, and coming up with uh, something that, that that is really a nice tuner because uh, we didn't want to just throw some a tuner in there that wasn't going to be good. Uh, we wanted to make sure it was it held its own. Yep. 
Now, uh, we've got a bunch of pictures of guitar cables on there. Is, is the guitar cable a significant variable in this whole equation when you're talking about the signal coming from the guitar getting all the way through the system? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of talk in the industry about guitar cables and the sound of guitar cables and all that kind of stuff. And it is important. Um, if we go to the next slide, we talk about uh, input interfacing. Uh, there's a couple of things, the input clip point and the input impedance and how those things um, relate to the guitar. Um, the, we'll talk about clip point first because it's on the list, but clip point with a wireless system is always a little bit of a challenge. You know, when we look at guitar signals and we actually measure some high output passive guitars, they can create some transients that are uh, exceptionally high, like surprisingly high. Um, and what we find out, though, is that there's really no guitar amps or pedals out there that actually pass this stuff through. And so when we, we make our decisions about like well, how, much, how much input headroom do we design in, um, what we try to do is make sure that our stuff has more headroom than standard guitar pedals and, and amps. Um, but you can still run into those situations where you, you make the little red light come on. Uh, what we always say is like, the, the, the big difference between our stuff and, and standard guitar stuff is they don't put red lights on any guitar pedals because they would be going off all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people would be wondering, why is this thing clipping? Yes. Uh, you know, you have these crazy transients at the front end. and, and it, uh, So that's been, a ch it's always been a little bit of a challenge with wireless systems, like balancing that, uh, that headroom versus noise, uh, which we can get into later. Mm -hmm. uh, the other big issue really is that input impedance. Um, Passive guitars specifically, the the cable and the and the input resistance essentially of the uh, the thing that you plug into it um, have a big effect on tone, and the the cable really is it's about the capacitance and the resistance of your input device. Um, so, you know, we kind of target really the three thirty to. 470 picofarad, which is like 15 to 20 feet of good cable, plugged into a Fender Twin, you know, one meg input impedance, which is pretty standard on a lot of pedals and stuff. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. If you do a uh, super long coily cable into a vintage fuzz face like Hendrix, you're going to get a different kind of tone. Um, in the early days of wireless, people noticed this a lot because of a lot of the, the pros were using long cables and then switched to wireless and their cable capacitance changed pretty dramatically. And, in, you know, they talk about in the early days of guys going in and adding capacitance to get their tone back to where it was. And I think, in general, people have gotten more used to the low capacitance tone. Uh, I don't know if you have a comment on that, Dave. Is that low capacitance tone? I mean, yeah. I know that when I was working in shops, I mean, George L. Cable and a lot of low capacitance cable was getting more popular and people would buy... Mm -hmm. A spool of it or X length and, and do that. Um, I mean, I, you wonder if, just because generally when you're using wireless now, I mean, the, the actual cable usage is shorter, right? Because yeah. you have a short cable going from your guitar to the transmitter. Yeah. And generally then you're going to have shorter cables going from the receiver yeah. to the amp. I mean, I, well, those, that those may, are that may be one of the reasons why people are getting more used to a different tone also yeah. is I think a lot more people use wireless and maybe the cable isn't factoring in. Some of it's also you guys designing, you know, systems as such and, and uh, I mean, I like the tone of it. I, I like less, of, like the less capacitance. Right. I, I prefer it too. I'm a telly guy and I like a nice bright guitar and so, you know, I don't have a tone control on my guitar because it just makes it a little extra brighter. <laughs> I never used it anyway, right? <laughs> uh, but... Yeah, I guess the, the, the thing to talk about there is like with, we, we target that on every wireless. So all of our wireless is, is consistently in that ballpark of the 10 to 20 foot cable. And what I found is, you know, with, with a lot of this newer digital wireless stuff that we've been working on, when we start doing A-B comparison tests, you have to be really careful how you set that test up because plugging in a different guitar cable can change the tone enough that that becomes the thing that you start to hear as the difference. So I have this, I have this uh, 
was it Layla, Layli? What's that company that makes the switchers? Uh, one of their pedals, it's got a buffered input so that I can do like loop switching and switch in wireless, but use a buffered drive so that the guitar impedance is it's isolated and the changing of cables and stuff doesn't affect the guitar tone. Uh, we have a really good uh, graph on the next slide. Uh, that this one, this is a graph that I did a while back when we were talking about guitar cable capacitance and what what effects does it have. And essentially, it's a it's a model of a standard Strat style single coil pickup, uh, nothing fancy, and with no load whatsoever. Although you still have uh, 250k volume pot and 250k tone pot and all that, but with no ca cable capacitance. Um, you get the red curve. And then as you add capacitance, um, you start to shift that resonance point down. And it's a resonance because it's a, the inductance of the pickups interact with the capacitance and you get it's a second order, third order kind of thing. And you get this peaking. And you see the peak actually goes up, but it moves down. And you can start to make a single coil sound more like a humbucker as you add capacitance to it, essentially. Um, as you reduce the resistance, then that peak gets damped down. So if you have a low resistance and high capacitance, it's really dull sounding. Um, but you can see how it's, it's enough to, it makes a pretty significant difference in the, in the frequency response of a guitar pickup. And uh, you don't want that changing around on you. Um, so, Especially if you've played the same rig for years and years and then one day you switch. Yeah, or you have to, you know, something, you have to switch cables or something like that, or you end up in a situation where you have, you could have a pretty significant difference. Mm -hmm. um, you'll notice that, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, what about output interfacing? So this, is, this slide we put together, I wanted to talk a little bit about receiver outputs to pedal boards and all that. Um, they're not ideal. Uh, in that uh, you have, well, let's talk about the, the bullet points there, right? We have gain structure is the first thing we talk about and this whole unity gain thing. You're trying to get the, the level that you're sending to your pedals to be the same level as if you just had a cable, if that's what you want. Um, and so there's output adjustments that you have to make on the receiver. You've got generally XLR outputs on most wireless receivers. We do try to do quarter inch outputs on everything that we do. Uh, and we try to make it a little bit easier to hit that unity gain point for guitar players. Um, but in general, uh, each system's a little different and you have to, you have to kind of go looking for it. Um, receiver outputs being unbalanced and also rack mounted and some of the, the higher end stuff with power, big power supplies and things like that you can start to run into ground loop problems and interfacing problems like that, which is a real pain. Um, and so one of my favorite devices is that, that Radial Pro RMP. It's a really handy little uh, box you can throw on a pedal board and you can take line level balance signal, run it as far as you want into that thing, have a ground lifted uh, transformer isolated signal to feed your, feed your pedals. Um, on the high end stuff like Axiant, systems, which, you know, is a pretty expensive system, but that essentially we build that into the output stage. Um, but on a lower tier wireless, it's just too expensive to put that stuff inside. But that's a handy, that's a handy box for a lot of reasons. Um, and that allows you to run longer cables and eliminate hum ground loops and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, the, the unbalanced nature of guitar is, is a challenge always. Um, you know, we've had situations where, you know, people went from a plastic wireless system to a, to a nice rack mount wireless system, and then all of a sudden they get hum because now there's a ground loop in their rig, but they just spent a bunch of money on this higher end wireless system, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But now, it, now you have a, a rack mounted thing, you have ground connections that you didn't have before. Um, different amps, you know, fenders react differently than Marshalls, you know, how they do their, the ground wiring and how sensitive they are to uh, shield noises and things like that, shield currents. Um, so that's always a challenge, and I'm a big fan of isolation transformers for that reason. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, some cases they're needed, right? I mean, some of our wireless systems, like a uh, popular one we get a lot of calls on uh, from tours are ULXD, the, the yeah. digital wireless, uh, because people like the form factor. There's a quad receiver for that one, so yep. four channels on one rack space. But unfortunately, with so much stuff crammed in the back, yeah, there's no quarter inch output, so you you you're you're forced into balanced line level out and boxes this, this like is this. The perfect box. Yeah, boxes like this Pro RMP really are almost a necessity. Yeah, uh, and if you're doing like four that. channels, you don't want to be running to four different guitar amps because that that exacerbates that problem mm -hmm. a lot. Like anybody that's ever jumpered amps and stuff, you know that those things you got to isolate that stuff uh, because you you end up with ground loops and it doesn't take a lot in a high gain rig to to not sound good, right? Um, but yeah, that's a really good example of where you want to use that kind of that kind of uh, external device. And, and uh, you were talking about gain structure, and I actually wanted to comment. Like, I actually, that's one of the reasons I use wireless sometimes when I do is not so much for the mobility aspect, which is kind of the obvious reason maybe to go <laughs> wireless, but for the flexibility and gain structure. I mean, uh -huh. sometimes being a tele guy, you know, I have no caster pickups, which are like old vintage tele, low output. Yeah. And I almost find that I get better sort of tone out of my pedal rig when I'm able to push, push the gain harder. a little bit with the wireless system. I mean, so it's, doing it's flat it. gain, so I maybe go a little bit above unity, maybe whatever, 3 dB or yeah. 6 dB. Sometimes I just push it harder. Not, not so much with the humbucker guitars, right. but I don't know if you can comment on that as far as your, your yeah. experience with pedals and, and I mean, gain structure with those and how the, the wireless interacts. The unity gain, the unity gain thing is is important to some people and you know I'll say we we went down to Nashville and met with some some major high-end guitar techs and and looked at their rigs and we found in one case you know the wireless was putting 12 dB of boost at the front end of his rig and I asked him about it and he's like well it was like that when I showed up for the you know he inherited this guitar rig from the previous guitar tech and he said I I don't like that because if you ever have to go back to a cable, now you've got this 12 dB boost difference. So I started changing it, but then the artist noticed, and he could hear subtle differences, and then he said, hey, just put it back because I like the way it was before. And so, I mean, there's really no rule that says you have to do unity gain, although a lot of guitar techs will say try to because if, if for whatever reason the wireless is not available that day and you have to go back to a cable, now your, your gain structure can get screwed up. So unless you have another little boost pedal or something, you can match it, but uh, it just makes for an easier switch over and things like that. So there's, there's no rule that says you have to use Unity Gain. Um, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, what else we uh, have? Oh, this is probably where it's a good place to start talking, because Dave mentioned ULXD. Yes. And, you know, lots of people are familiar with analog wireless systems. Now digital ones are becoming much more common, so I think this is probably a good place to dive into that end of the swimming pool. Yeah, this is, this is a, uh, I've been here long enough that I spent quite a number of years working on analog wireless systems and then s helped to start the digital wireless department. Um, and there's, there's a pretty big difference in the, the audio performance and, and what happens to your signal uh, between analog and digital. Um, in an analog system, you, you're doing a companding um, that is that is purely level based uh, it's a noise reduction systems based basically on the, the early days of Dolby. And I think right? we, we have, have we got a graphic on that. Yeah, that show that kind of stuff mm -hmm. where you compress down and then expand back up. And as long as your expansion your matches your compression, you get your signal back. Um, the problem was always where that falls apart is in transient signals. Um, it's really hard for them to track. When, the, when you have high, sharp peaks and things like that, which is what's in a lot of guitar signals. Um, so through the years, you know, we worked at, at just tuning in and dialing in those, those analog companion systems to uh, push the errors down further and further. And every new wireless was like, okay, this now this one is the best one ever and then until we find the next best thing. And w when we went to digital, the this whole analog companding thing just completely went away, and uh, it was it allowed for basically a, a, a paradigm shift and a big jump in in uh, the audio quality, specifically for uh, for instruments, transient mm -hmm. stuff, um, and so that 
you know, as a guitar player, that was a, that was a big deal for me. Anyway, I was very excited to to go work on the digital stuff because it, it was a it was a major leap forward, um, and uh, it changed what I did as a designer quite a bit because in the past I spent all this time working on these companding systems, uh, and it it kind of opened up and uh, it it changed what I worked on. So now I'm working more on input and output stages and and really. Uh, better interfacing the uh, the signal and and um, yeah, basically that. So. so, in addition to uh, being able to handle transients, what about how a digital system or an analog system handles uh, the back end of the signal, the decay? So, when you strum a chord and then just let the guitar sit there, mm -hmm. I've heard that's always an issue about. How do different companding systems respond to the trailing off of the signal? Yeah, that was always an issue with, with the artifacts of companding is the tracking, not only on the transients, but on as you fade it off into the noise floor, uh, did they track really well and do you get a little extra bump or do you get a little extra gating uh, and trying to keep that nice and smooth. When we did audio reference companding a few years ago, that was ULX was the first one. Right, the ULXS and ULXP. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so we've been using that for a while. That that virtually eliminated all of that, um, and that was the, one of the big advantages of that companion system, um, was that kind of pumping background noise floor kind of thing that happened uh, with previous generation stuff. Um, but with digital, essentially we're, we're capturing the 24 dB dynamic range at the front end, and we're passing that through without having to compromise the the, basically the dynamic range that you do in an analog system. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that essentially goes away. You, you get your dynamics, you get your full dynamic range, and uh, we still have to compress the data, but it's done completely differently. Um, and we put, you know, like in the graph here, or the, the slide, there's error correction data and control data, stuff that goes in there, stuff to protect the, the audio from any potential bit errors and things like that. Uh, you know, sending audio, sending anything wireless is a, makes it a little bit vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And right. so we, you know, we wrap some things around it to, to make sure that it gets there and, and uh, as undisturbed as possible. And, and if bad things do happen, uh, they don't sound terribly bad. <laughs> right, because it doesn't matter how good the signal sounds if it's dropping out all the time. Or, yeah, that, that's the philosophy. And, that we and have. if there's a dropout, <laughs> you don't want it to be a, a noisy, ugly, gritchy kind of dropout, right. but a, a nice, quiet, silent dropout. I also do some racing, and in racing, we always say, to win, you must first finish. Okay. <laughs> Just kind of the the uh, the same kind of thing. You have to get the signal across first in in a, in a robust manner, uh, and so sometimes you you have to trade off some things to to make sure that that's the case. But I think with this digital stuff now, it, it it's so much better than the old days that I'm, I'm really happy about it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, most people who try a digital wireless system are, are really blown away by not only the sound quality, but how you know reliable the signal is. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, all right, one thing that always comes up when we talk about digital systems, though, is latency. And uh, how big of an issue is that with digital wireless systems for guitar? Um, for guitar, it's not a terribly a, a big issue. If you latency comes in because it's it's a digital system, so you have to do digital conversion, which takes a little bit of time, and then there's some there's some stuff that happens in the digital realm that requires some time, uh, and so I think we're well, each system is a little different, but right. we're on the order of single-digit milliseconds. Right. ULXD, I think, is a little under three milliseconds. 0. 0.9. 0. 0.9. Yep. GLXD, somewhere around four or five milliseconds, I think. Right. Depending on the mode, but yeah, right. right. You're mm -hmm. still so single digits. the thing to remember there is a millisecond is roughly a foot of distance. So standing... For a sound wave. Right, for mm -hmm. a sound wave. So if you have three milliseconds of latency, then... When you stand three feet in front of your guitar amp, it's kind of like standing six feet in front or in terms of latency. It's not that big a deal. Uh, it's like adding three feet. Now, if you start walking quite a ways away from your instrument, you start to run into latency issues purely because 
the time it takes for the sound to travel but from your amp to your ears can become long. Mm -hmm. At that point, the acoustic latency dwarfs yeah. the... Uh, yeah, the acoustic latency, latency is, yeah. is higher than the, than, the, uh, than the actual electrical latency. Mm -hmm. um, so at the single digit stuff, it's not an issue. You know, people that, um, where, where latency can come into is with vocals or um, woodwinds, saxophones and stuff where you have a lot of bone conduction of your original signal. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a bigger issue. Um, Particularly for folks using in-ear monitors. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly with that. Once you're hearing things through speakers and stuff, then the kind of the latency thing is, is out the window. Um, but yeah, we, we try to push our stuff down as low as we can go. But there's always a trade-off, again, in that robustness. Um, if you give it a little bit more latency, you can make it a little bit more robust in the RF realm. Mm -hmm. So it's finding that sweet spot of you know, as low latency as possible while still providing a reliable path or a reliable signal. Um, and that's, that's basically a design philosophy or a design choice that we have to make every mm -hmm. time we do it. Um, and that's a characteristic of digital systems. Analog systems don't have any of their own latency. Not, not inherently. Um, you can, there was a slide earlier that mentioned hybrid systems, and there are some hybrid systems out there. We've never done a hybrid wireless. We've done hybrid ear monitors. Mm -hmm. oh, Axion is technically a hybrid. That's, for, that's true. Yes, Axion is hybrid. That Axion's doing some digital audio processing mm -hmm. in the back end to kind of make the yeah, panning even that. better and the noise reduction even better, like, you know, yep. emphasis and preemp the emphasis, preemphasis even better. But that's, I mean, I think the total latency there is under a millisecond. It's, it's right around, it's, it's negligible. You yeah. know, it's... You don't have any, trans you get, yeah, you don't have any right. transport latency, so you really just have the receiver side conversion right. latency, which is pretty small. Mm -hmm. And I, Dave put, brings up a good point there. That, the choice to go hybrid there was really, you know, in all these analog companion systems, it was about driving errors out of the system. With analog stuff, you always have component tolerances and temperature sensitivities and, and all of these things that make for things to be not perfect. Um, and when you have a transmitter and receiver that you're trying to track each other uh, perfectly, that's where the design challenge is. If On the Axiom system, we were able to take the, the receiver side and make it digital. And the one nice thing about the digital is that it's always the same every time, no matter what. So you essentially cut half of your variances out of that Mm -hmm. Companion system, and so you cut your errors in half uh, naturally, which mm -hmm. is which helps make that system be that's our top sounding analog analog system. Mm -hmm. Really. Um, um, what about the gain structure when we're talking about analog and digital? And and we mentioned the term unity gain earlier, and yep. and it. How concerned do people need to be with going after unity gain? Is is it? We kind of touched on whether that's something that is really important or not. But how do you tweak your analog and your digital system to give you the best performance? Whether you not yeah. whether or not you want unity gain. This is a big subject. How are we doing on time? Okay, <laughs> we're we're okay. Unity gain. Do I want this? And how do I get it? You don't have to have unity gain. But like I said, I I personally set my stuff up so that if I have swap in a cable, it's exactly the same. Because to me, exactly how that guitar hits that boost pedal, it it change. You know, if you start changing stuff, then it throws everything off, right? Um, so I go for that. Um, yeah, we're, we should talk a little bit. I mean, on an, in the analog days, you essentially had a transmitter gain and then a receiver output level, and you had to balance those two things against how you wanted that system to perform and sound, and then how do you then find your, your unity gain point. Um, with an analog system, if you, if you crank up the transmitter gain, uh, you can make a lower noise system, but then you, you run into more compression, companion, distortion type things as you start to overload that companion system. If you back it off and try and preserve all that, then you have to gain up the output of the receiver more, and you bring up more noise floor. So it was always this trade-off. Um, with the digital system, since we're preserving the full dynamic range, that's not really an issue anymore. And on ULXD, originally we said, oh, we only need one, one gain control. We'll put it in the receiver. Um, and that was great. And then somebody said, yeah, but 
you know, like Dave's got, you know, when I play my no caster, I want it to be up 3 dB from, from my uh, SG, so how do I do that? So we actually put a gain in the transmitter as well. We call it transmitter offset or gain offset so that you can have different transmitters with different gain levels and things like that. Yeah, I, I, although I'll, I'll warn folks about if you are a ULXD user, uh, the transmitter offset is useful for when you're, you want to switch guitars that are using the same receiver, right? Yeah. Guitar one or two. But be careful about overusing that setting. It's not really meant as a transmitter gain control because it also does lower the headroom. Yeah. And so I've seen some people uh, go a little bit nuts with that setting, and, and they'll, they'll call us and say, I'm getting input clip all the time. Mm -hmm. And then you ask them what the transmitter offset setting is, and it's something like plus 12 or mm -hmm. plus 15 or close to the max, which I think is plus 20 or plus, plus 21. 21. Yeah. Uh, and that, that just will lower your headroom so much that maybe even a typical humbucker, passive humbucker guitar will probably clip that. Oh, so, easy. Easy. so I, I would, I would use that setting sparingly. Uh, if anything, um, there's a pad on the packs, which can be useful for active guitars or active basses and things like that as a 12 dB pad, which can help. Uh, but, but John, yeah, John, yeah. great point about digital wireless. That, as long as you don't mess with the transmitter offset too much, you don't typically get too many issues, and, and as long as you're seeing two or three green lights on the receiver, you typically have a, enough signal. The analog systems is crucial, though, because we get that a yeah. lot, where uh, we used to get a call all the time where it was, you know, no, it was hissy, right. uh, noisy audio. The pack, you know, let's say as an example, uh, UHFR wireless was probably the worst offender with this, where we had packs shipping at, at there's two levels, there's two settings in there sensitivity and gain and both were set to zero and that's all always too low and usually what I tell people for setting gain structure with wireless systems is you can set the pack with almost with, with really not having any audio passing out of it you can you can look at the meters yep and you want to you know set your gain level on your wireless pack your analog system wireless pack so that you most of those audio meters light up obviously avoiding the clip light. So as high as you can get, as many lights as you can light up without yeah. clipping. A little it's, red is okay, though. A little red, because there, there's, what, about 6 dB of headroom typically with most systems? Yeah, but again, with the guitar system, you're always going to have a little bit of that, and you don't want to trade off. You don't want to yeah. be too fearful of, but, of but a red as, light that's going to be clipped anyway. As our, as our esteemed coworker Tim Veer, likes to say, you paid a lot of money for those LEDs on the audio meter. <laughs> light them up. Light them up. Uh, and then once you have that set where you're getting good deflection, because that means you're going to modulate the signal well, you're getting good deviation, that's good gain structure for the wireless system, then you can play around with the audio output level to your amp or pedal board or whatever you have. But you really want to, that audio meter is reflective of the wireless system gain, and you want to make sure that that's not too low on analog systems. On digital, like John, to John's point, not as crucial. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, with the analog stuff, the whole wireless industry hasn't been very helpful for guitar players to help them find that unity gain setting. And in a lot of analog systems, just get a switcher, go back and forth between a cable and just make sure that you're, you're getting roughly the same level. Use a clean tone because then that's how you can really tell that your, uh, your level is the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, usually, and I, I try to make sure it's in every user guide, like, it's silly telling people read the user guide, but in every user guide for every system, there should be some way of something in there that says, hey, if you're a guitar player and you want Unity gain, this is how you have to set it up. Mm -hmm. um, at the analog systems, though, it was this teeter-totter. If you turn up the transmitter 2 dB, then you have to turn the receiver down 2 dB to get back to that same point. Um, and with the digital systems, there's fewer controls required. Um, there's another topic I want to... In wireless systems, zero doesn't mean unity gain. Mm, it never, mm -hmm. it never has, um, and it's mostly because of the the people using microphones. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, for guitar systems, I think on ULXD, what is it, minus eighteen? Dave, do you remember um, the receiver gain setting for unity? It's in the user guide, yeah, and I don't remember to get unity there. gain, you basically set the receiver to minus eighteen. It's like, why would that be the case? And it's, it has to do with microphones and how microphone users, and since they predominate, they're, you know, the major customer, then mm -hmm. they win that argument. <laughs> I've, I've, I've had that argument 
many times with, with marketing folks about, yes, but what about the guitar players? And uh, I said, yeah, well, they don't buy as much. <laughs> They're not as big a divas. Right. Is that, is that, maybe that's it. As, and I say that as a singer. <laughs> right. So. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it usually we'll put in the, uh, in the user guide, and I know it's in ULXD and, and GLXD. GLXD, we get to ship at Unity Gain because it's for guitar players only anyway, so mm -hmm. buy that one and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but all other systems, you have to spend that little bit of time looking it up and, and uh, finding where a Unity Game Point is. And I'll say that it's kind of across all manufacturers as well, and none of us have agreed on a standard for how we set gains in wireless systems, and from model to model, it'll change. Uh, and that's just been one of the the annoying things of, of, of my career, I found, <laughs> anyway. But I can't solve it uh, at this point, so uh, just play along. Well, but as long as it sounds good, that's the important thing, That's right? the important thing. I, the other thing is use your ears. Um, you know, a lot of times people get hung up on, well, I keep hitting the red light, and I don't want to do It's like, listen to it. Uh, you know, a little bit of red light hitting is not a bad thing, and it can be a good thing. Um, if it sounds good, it is good, right? We're playing instruments. Um, this is art, right? So, right. I think sometimes people get a little too obsessed with what are the rules, and that there aren't just so many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there shouldn't. Ha there shouldn't be. Well, uh, I'm sure, Cheryl, we've probably got some questions. If your capacitance and your inductance are all out of whack, and uh, you know, now's the time to. Uh, Hit Dave and John up with your questions if they've knocked you out. Uh, do we have some interesting ones in there, Cheryl? We have a couple, and please feel free to type them in. We've got about 20 minutes, so we can answer quite a few questions. Um, so get those questions in now. Um, the first one we're actually going to go to is a pre-submitted question, um, and it starts off with this. I know Sure does not offer a 2.4 gigahertz wireless system. Well, that's actually not true. Um, the GLXD system that we were talking about earlier, the one that also comes with that GLXD 16 guitar pedal-specific form factor, that is a 2.4. 2.4 um, gigahertz digital system. All the GLXD components are in the 2.4 uh, gigahertz band. Um, so moving on in the question, um, sort of a sort of a story problem here. So sort okay. of application specific. <laughs> um, we have a digital audio system fully controlled over dual band Wi-Fi, uh, over a dual band Wi-Fi router, wireless guitar devices on 2.4 gigahertz, lighting controlled over 2. gigahertz, etc. These systems have serious RF interference with each other, namely wireless guitar and lighting. I'm not sure how or if these systems have any way of 2.4 auto gigahertz auto channel selection during power up, but if they do, I can see how power up sequence may be key in operating multi-device 2.4 gigahertz systems. Uh, any advice or recommendations you could comment on or address during the webinar would be greatly appreciated. So let's let's talk about this. It sounds like we've got a lot of stuff going on in that 2.4 gigahertz section. I'll, there. I'll throw this one to Dave. This is definitely up his alley. I'll uh, keep the question in front of me so I can make sure to address. <laughs> address the issues here. So uh, one of the key words in that question was 2.4 gigahertz wireless systems for stage. So the, I guess the assumption would be that uh, a, a, maybe a large stage. Uh, Cheryl's correct. Uh, GLXD is a 2.4 gigahertz system. The GLXD6 receiver is perfect for pedal boards. But, but the key there would be we do actually have some people using it for stage, but mainly those folks that are going to stick, you know, 20 to 30 feet away from their pedal board, not really wandering out on catwalks or, or going pretty far. Keith doesn't use that. It's right. You've right. got to remain line of sight. You, it's line of sight. And, and particularly then, uh, your, the comments about all the Wi-Fi sources and, and other interferences is a good one. Uh, then the key becomes twofold. Uh, one becomes range, and the other becomes using uh, systems that have sort of built-in uh, interference avoidance. So GLXD does have this. Uh, the system currently works with, um, I think depending on the group, it's got three primary frequencies that can, can move, and there's sort of a bank of backup frequencies. Uh, different groups have sort of different maximum channel capacities. But if there's a lot of stuff already there, like wireless lighting, lots of other 2.4 gigahertz sources, uh, that may not be enough, at which point range really becomes an issue. And could the system work? It might, but it might only work for 
up to five or ten feet. You're talking of small distances. So, like it, so if the requirement is medium distance, medium range, like I need to walk 50 to 100 feet away, this may not be the right product. I mean, as it stands yet, I mean, you really want to get, if you want range, you need clear spectrum, and you also need antenna height to get it up in the air above other sources that are going to soak up the RF and block the RF. But as long as you're staying pretty close to these things, uh, you know, like pedal board receivers and that such, it, it may very well work for the stage. But every situation is going to be different, so it's it's uh, hard to generalize in that regard. Yeah, it sounds like they have a lot of wa Wi-Fi. Yeah, control. and 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 usually for folks that have you know 2.4 lighting control and lots of routers and all that stuff, I mean the key, it, it may be to choose a different digital system. You know, go UHF uh, where you can remote the antennas up high and coordinate with everything else, and then mm -hmm. that's or find an IT guy to help you coordinate all of your. Put your lighting control. Right. I don't we, know we about also, the lighting We control. also have another digital system that's uh, in the price range of, of GLXD, which is in the 900 megahertz right. frequency band, PG, PGXD. Uh, you know, and there's there's probably going to be more as, as we deal with spectrum constantly being you know roiled and <laughs> right. and moved. Uh, there's going to be more options in different bands and and. Uh, yeah, I think it, I think it all comes down to real estate. Um, you know, there's there's just a certain point where if you're just trying to fit too much in a in a smallish in a, in a, a restricted level of spectrum, there's only so much you can fit in there. And um, I think Dave's got good advice that you know if you're really really having issues, um, you might just want to look at maybe putting your guitar wireless in a different piece of real estate, in a different plot of land. <laughs> we're, we're making wireless now, VHF, UHF, 900, mm -hmm. 2.4. Do we have anything else? One dot, something. In other well, countries, yeah. Yeah, right. in other countries. Right. Uh, and, and for us, it's, you know, with the spectrum uh, becoming more limited and, and more crowded, it's, it's about playing, playing the board. Uh, p placing more bets out there and, right. and making sure that people have a place that they can go. Uh, it's still kind of early in that, so not every system is in every has every option. Uh, yeah. But like Dave said, the the what was it the PGXD, right? That's a great sounding system at 900 megahertz. That's also on licensed band, uh, but there's far less. There's far uh, less stuff. Typical going on interference there. in stage environments. And, yeah, and if that. you know you have a ton of 2.4, maybe 2.4 wireless for your guitar is not the best yeah. option. And, and even if you only have a little, you know, you are using a Wi-Fi router, maybe yeah. that's it, or, you know, you, something on your phone or maybe some kind of, like, lyric sheet or some, some device, you want to try your best to keep these things as far from your wireless as you can. I mean, if you don't want to load up. Don't stream video during your gig. Maybe. <laughs> that. I mean, you know, you're wearing, a, like, P, a GLXD, actually, the, the pack is receiving signal as well. Um, and if you have your phone in your back pocket with the Wi-Fi enabled, you know that may be not the best thing either. So, it, a lot of the things w with wireless involves uh, component distance distances. You know, keep keep your transmitter and receiver as close as you can. That'll maximize the, the robustness of the of the link. Don't set it keep, next to the router. And keep interference sources as far from that system as you can, and also minimize what you can as far as the interference sources. And that's the only way to get around it. But I mean, as everyone's been saying, at the end of the day, spectrum's limited. If you're already using a ton of 2.4, sorry to say that may not be the best choice, but there are other choices either here or coming. And it may be compounded by the fact that the one he's using, apparently not as sure, may not have the automatic frequency agility. Yeah. So it yeah. may be... We don't know, know what that is. It may right, be stuck on one Wi-Fi channel and unable to move. Yeah. Well, and, and a little bit of clarification here. Um, the questioner types in uh, the guitar. The guitar is actually causing problems with the Wi-Fi controlled thing. So mm. actually, the oh. guitar is stepping on. Well, that's fine. The then. other things. Yeah, we're okay with that. <laughs> yeah. Sure, no problem there. Um, right, but the that's same the same problem. same points. If if those other things are crucial and there's no choice with those, and those have to stay where they're at, uh, there are other choices for the guitar wireless. So, mm -hmm. Right. Any other good questions, Cheryl? Okay, we've got a couple more here. Um, this is another application-specific thing. Um, I have two of the, they say DLXD, I think you mean GLXD, wireless guitar pedal systems. Loves them, loves the tuner. Um, and they have great work. They have worked well indoors and outdoors, which is great. Um, the problem is that um, this person is trying to get both of the transmitters co to connect to one receiver for quick switching between guitar and lap steel. Um, this person has followed the manual's directions to the letter, checked online, 
for directions and FAQs, um, but is still having problems. Um, had a little bit of issue with the repair, but doesn't think that was one of the issues. Um, so he just wants maybe some help troubleshooting that configuration or, or if we know of any remedy or recommendation. So uh, to address that question, it sounds like uh, this person's been through a lot of the literature and trying things and also it almost sounds like service as well. I, it's hard to really troubleshoot this thing, especially if, if the individual has been following the instructions and maybe there's a small step or something along the way that hasn't been followed. Maybe there's a timing issue of pushing certain buttons and that sort of thing. Uh, rather than spend more time on that, what I'd advise this person and, and anybody listening, honestly, is we have a, a very knowledgeable applications engineering techn product technical support department. Uh, you can get a live person on the phone. They'd be happy to kind of talk you through and through this issue uh, as best they can uh, so they can better, you can describe to that person the sequence of the lights or exactly what you're doing. Uh, so that the phone number for that group is 847-600-8440. Uh, is the direct line. Of course, you can always call the 1-800 number if you need, 1-800-516-2525. Uh, I believe, <laughs> yes. Somebody better check that out for me. And then, of course, <laughs> our check, email. Check, check, check that number for me, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Uh, and uh, there's options at that point um, I, I, that will tell you, you know, how to reach the product technical support department. And it, that would probably be the best way to go about really troubleshooting that because it really sounds like it's a very, it's a very timing uh, intensive sequence uh, and it's, there's no, I mean, I can tell you what to do again, but it'd be the same instructions as the user guide. Right. Right? I so think you want to talk live with a person Right, there's like something that's not quite there and a human would be better able to diagnose that specific problem. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, uh, that toll-free number is 800-25-SURE or 1-800-257-4873. That's, We're why just, I, that's why I dial the direct All now, quantities are limited. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, right. sometimes sometimes the answer is really just having somebody on, mm -hmm. on the line that you can talk through step by step because there's just so many little variables and factors. And, and we do. We do have a lot of smart guys here that can, can help talk you through it and help you get down to the bottom of the issue. Um, so I just have one other question in the queue right now. Uh, so if anybody else has a question, get it in right now. Um, and uh, <laughs> this is a hot bucket, but button topic and tangentially related, um, but I think this is a question for Chris. Hey, Chris, what's the latest on the FCC and open <laughs> frequencies? <laughs> I think, is this I a think, plant? I think, yeah. every, I think every webinar we've had for the past yes. year, somebody has brought this somebody topic has up, asked understandably the so. The short answer is it's not done yet. Uh, the medium-length answer is uh, they've been through a couple of rounds of the 600 megahertz band auction. Uh, that have been unsuccessful at meeting their uh, financial targets for the amount of revenue generated. And so uh, I believe this week is uh, still part of the second or third round, and when that's finished, then they go into a fourth round with a new reduced set of spectrum. So in the first round, they were trying to recover a ton of spectrum. It's gone down just a bit and reduced. Dave's got some news. Um. I believe, yeah, we're, we're on round three, stage three, that's still going on. Uh, I think as of last week, I think the stage three reverse auction was something like 36% done. Um, let's see, it's continuing. And I think, I know stage two, uh, I think we're down to where the clearing target is just a hair over 100 megahertz which means like about 19 TV channels to be reallocated. But yeah, the revenue, the, the, get, the reverse auction versus forward auction numbers haven't really been right. posted. But, but I mean, I think the last stage, they were still some odd 30 billion or so short of, you know, right. what, the, what the target would have been. So, so this will probably need to go through gonna, one or two more rounds. Spill, it's going to, a couple more rounds, and it's going to spill over into the beginning of 2017. I, I think you're right. I think it's is, doubtful is this will be wrapped right. up by Christmas. And the amount of spectrum that's getting every round, is, every is round less they're, than what it Right. Every, every time they go they to a new round, the goal, right, they, re they reduce. It's going to drop by about 6 megahertz, I yep, think, Yep, they'll just reduce it and try to get a little less. So in, in a way, this is kind of good for us, because the longer this goes, the less spectrum gets lost, yes. and, and the more spectrum gets remains open for wireless microphones. So we like it, that. It's sort of it's odd in that depending on the clearing target, the, the actual gaps in spectrum that we could potentially use shift in terms of their size. 
Right. So certain scenarios are better than others, uh, but it's really hard to root for one right. <laughs> over the other. Just it'll it'll change very slightly. Mm -hmm. And I think I think the the best new the best thing to know here is that because of the delays, you know, once once we know what the eventual outcome is, there is still a transition period. Mm -hmm. um, so people that have spectrum have uh, devices in spectrum that might be affected, you still have quite a bit of time to start thinking ahead and maybe putting aside a little bit of money if you have to right. vacate to a new piece of spectrum, but right. there's more time. Yeah, so. once once the auction's concluded and the TV channels have been reassigned and shuffled around a bit, the FCC is going to issue a, a public notice about that, and then that sort of starts a clock ticking for a 39-month transition period. And in most cases, people will have, you know, probably about three years, in some cases a little less, um, to make their transition to new equipment if that's necessary. You know, in, in the U.S., it's really don't buy stuff in the 600s, buy stuff in the four, four to 500s. Yeah, I mean, in the meantime, going towards the lower part of the band is the safest decision. Yep. You know, you may find out that some parts of the 600 megahertz band remain usable because there will be in some gaps between parts of the band. Uh, but, you know, we don't know that for sure, and we don't know where they'll be, right. so it's And this doesn't tricky. affect GLXD or PGXD? No, mm -mm. Cool. Just, the, just the UHF band. In yep. fact, the, the VHF band is also a safe bet, too. Yep. Yes. Uh, and yeah. I mean, just that's pretty new stuff, right? The VHF stuff's out, been out for, for yeah, us? Yeah, it's only been yeah. shipping a couple it's of months, I think. It's only been shipping a couple okay. months. Okay. I mean, it's not certainly, it's not interference-free. I mean, there is still, there are some DTV stations down there. Get those cool there. big antennas. Yes. <laughs> Less big than they used to be. That's right. <laughs> but physically big anyway. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's like anything else. You know, if, if you have questions about where you think things are going or where you're at versus where you need to go, I mean, you, the, you, know, you can always call us and we can make our best, our best recommendation given the information that's available right. at the time, which uh, still is not uh, a ton. We still don't know exactly where the, lander, the landing point is, uh, but we can certainly look up you know, the current landscape of things in your area, help with that, um, maybe make recommendations based on your application, and we'll see where we go. And But as far as new wireless, I mean, that's st it's still, you can still do what you were doing before. I mean, there's still a good deal of time. The sky's not uh, falling. Right, the sky's not falling, parts of it are loose. <laughs> It's important not to stand, uh, stand under the parts that are falling. You have time to invest in a yeah. good umbrella. Right. right. And if you want to keep up with this uh, on a daily basis, the easiest way, you can sign up for the FCC's Daily Digest. Ooh, that which sounds is, exciting. Which is, <laughs> ooh, yes, oh boy. It's the most exciting email I get each day. Uh, so in your email box, you'll get a, signing up for more things, a daily please. summary of everything the FCC is doing, including spectrum uh, matters, 99% uh, of which is, you know, avoiding, you know, robocalls and, uh, you know, junk faxes, so it's not interesting to us. But uh, when they do make any announcement or pass a ruling or make an announcement of any kind, it's in there. So you get it. Uh, in your mailbox, you'll know what's going on. So on an even hotter button topic, is anybody speculating on what the new administration you know, will do to these things? I, that's a great question. I have no idea. Too T soon to tell? Yeah. The, uh, typically, the, um, uh, a re the incoming president gets to appoint a new FCC chairman uh, from his own party, his or her own party. So we'll see if that happens this time. Uh, I, I don't, you know, all bets are off. I don't know what's going to happen. But, but the, the process will continue to move forward. I, I, I can't imagine any scenario where the spectrum auction just no, it's, stops. It's going to stop. happen. Yeah, it's going to happen because, because the, the spectrum has value and there are companies that want to use well, it. Well, and some of that value is already tied to uh, revenue that was spent already for extending tax. Uh, oh. Breaks. Could yeah. be. We yeah. already spent that money that we're basically. To is, I, I, <laughs> Great. If, if, if that's if that's held true, which I think it has, so I mean it, it'll go forward. It's not. It's not like it's going to turn into a barring a miracle. Here. You know, <laughs> but we just good. don't know in what shape it's right. Going we just to. don't know how much because of the nature of the auction. There's a forward auction and a reverse auction. You know, there's the broadcasters are going to say how much they want uh, in, to share in that revenue in order to move, and then they take that number and they try to jive it with the folks that want to buy the spectrum. And once those meet or give them the profit margin or the, you know, revenue structure that they want and need for that auction to be successful, then it'll be successful. Mm -hmm. And then they start the 
uh, unenviable task of moving everybody and figuring out where all the pieces fit. Mm -hmm. And like, like we said before, that's going to be up to a 39 month or so right. process. So we've seen this happen in the past, so we, we kind of have a sense of how long these things take. Well, this, this is a little, this is even more complicated than the 700 megahertz yeah. one. That one was basically, uh, we're going to sell this, get out. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we're going to move you, and there's no, I mean, there's no revenue sharing. There's right. no reverse auction there. And that even took a while. Yeah. Uh, this is going to take even longer. Take probably it. even longer. And the, 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 the other mystery, which we'll hopefully discover soon, is uh, how do we discover which market moves when? And so far, the, the source of that information is said to be these databases where you're, uh, rather than one big communication to say, to lay out a schedule, it's basically going to be, you know, check these databases that were created for the white space issue, which is not really happening. Uh, and um, and that, would, that will give you an idea of when the, the TV channels have moved. That's kind of right. the source of the information. And that may not be a nationwide all at once date either. It's possible they may try to do that on some sort of a rolling yeah, timetable sure. and it's say, possible. well, you know, these cities will make a transition on this date and these cities yeah, on that all, date. Yeah, the, the scheduling of it is all conjecture. We just know the right. time frame it's sent probably. It's kind of like buying a house. The negotiating process is still going back and forth, but we know at some point somebody's going to have to clean out their basement. Right. Well, rest assured, once we know what's going on, we will certainly be communicating with you guys, with all of our end users, letting you know kind of what we have available and, and what's going on, and, and we will definitely keep you up to date as we know. Do we have any listeners left? Uh, we we do, we do actually, <laughs> but hey, you know, there's some spectrum junkies out there. So, right. all right, we are out of time. We want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, we will not be doing a webinar next month, but please go to shore.com slash training. Um, you can also subscribe for updates, uh, I believe, off of that website. Um, and if you ever have any other questions, you can email to support at shore.com or call that number or 1-800-25-SURE. And we are here listening. So we hope you have a lovely day, and we will see you next time. Thank you all.